This is a talk about, um, entitled it Million Dollar Math and Physics, the Yang Mills Problem. It's uh, a, one of a sequence of talks I've been giving to a senior group called Oasis about the Clay Millennium Math Prizes, these million, $7 million math prizes, one of which has been solved. Six of them are, are unsolved. This is the one that has to do with high energy physics. Um, my subtitle for it is A Jekyll and Hyde Story About the Standard Model. We're going to see some beautiful things and also some very ugly and confusing things about what's called the standard model of uh, fundamental particles, fundamental physics, high energy physics, another way to say it. Um, so the goals here, I want to introduce the standard model of high energy physics very much from a mathematician's point of view, although uh, I'm not going to focus necessarily on rigor until the end, but um, I want to show you the mathematical beauty of it. I want to talk a bit about the deeply unexpected physical properties that it says that our universe has. That's certainly a fascinating thing about it. And hopefully get to some of the mathematical ugliness. Um, and in fact, the ugliness is kind of what the problem is about. How do you get rid of the ugliness? Uh, or at least deal with it. And at the end, we'll talk about why. what is the million dollar prize problem and why, uh, why is it important. And the whole uh, presentation is, of course, totally incomplete. It's supposed to be at a, at very much at a general audience level, not technical. It's very much my own personal take on the subject. I'm not uh, a particular expert in, uh, in the subject, but uh, you can see what you think. Some themes that are going to go through the whole presentation. Symmetry is the big one. We'll see that come up over and over and over again, and a lot of this is just kind of elucidating how important symmetry has become in uh, in these theories of physics. Infinity is very important. The distinction of continuous versus discrete. Continuous, like turning a knob slowly that it can have any value, or discrete, something that only comes in lumps or can ha have only a, a fixed kind of set of values that are sort of uh, set apart from each other. And interesting, we're going to have some unexpected things about continuous versus discrete eventually. Um, unification, like forces and, and uh, concepts being unified and classification uh, are also going to be really important. Being a classification, one absolutely huge achievement of science uh, from you know in the last few hundred years is starting with this, or really something much bigger than this. I just had, thought this was a pretty picture. All the different kinds of stuff out there in the world. This is just a small selection of all the different inorganic materials. Add that to all the organic compounds. It's just millions and millions of different kinds of stuff. How do you organize that? Well, in the 19th century, people figured out everything's made of different chemical elements. And there's only, uh, there's fewer than 100 of them, unless you make them in uh, uh, nuclear reactions, in which case there's, you get a few more. But it's, and they come in patterns. This table, this is the periodic table. The rows and columns mean things. They come in all kinds of patterns. Um, and then it, right around 1900, people realized uh, what people had been guessing for hundreds of thousands of years is that these guys are made of atoms. And then, since then, people have discovered that atoms even are not the, the fundamental things. And there's not a hundred unique different building blocks. We've got it down to just 16 different fundamental building blocks. And I'm not going to say a lot about um, this picture, but it's, it's in the background of, of what we're, we're, I'm going to talk about. This, these are the particles of the standard model. There are six kinds of quarks. These are the purple ones. And all of ordinary matter, anything you'd ever encounter outside of... Uh, a particle accelerator is made of up and down quarks. Electrons are pretty familiar. They, electricity is made of electric current. And then there's some other, it's friends called the leptons, neutrinos, and, and other particles. These are light, very light particles, as opposed to these guys, which are, are much heavier. And then it turns out that these particles over here, what are called the bosons, they act, their job is to carry forces. The photon is the particle of light. That's the most familiar of them. Um, the other ones are, are, are much more recent in terms of their discovery. Um, but the main thing I want to emphasize is that this is a, not a large number of constituents of the world. And this is pretty much everything there is. Now, they'll talk about how there's one thing that people want to add to this picture uh, to complete the standard model that people are, are hoping to do very soon. Um, and of course, there's, there's a lot of mysteries beyond this model, but it's tr truly an amazing achievement. Okay, so. I'd say the, the mathematician's uh, take on it might be, well, maybe what we've really reduced the world down to is these kind of cryptic diagrams. And it, it's just a tease here. turns out that these are a way to classify the different possible types of continuous symmetry. And I'll talk about that. 
So symmetry. How symmetry means answering this kind of question. Given some object that you're interested in, or a system, like a physical system, like an experiment, um, how can you transform it in a way that leaves it looking or behaving, in the case of a system, the same? So for example, a square here has various kinds of symmetries. You, you can rotate it by 90 degrees, counterclockwise, as is indicated here, or 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. Or these dashed orange lines indicate if you flip it across these guys, it remains the same. One way to think about this is, suppose I draw this square on a piece of paper, and then I say, close your eyes for a second, and then I do any one of these symmetry transformations, and then I say, open your eyes, and then I ask you, did I do anything? You shouldn't be able to tell me. That's what makes it a symmetry, that it, I've done something, but it, re it takes it back to the, exactly the status it had before. Uh, these guys, of an octagon or a, um, a pentagon, are going to have different amounts of symmetry. Here, is these dotted lines are all the different ways you could reflect it, and, and it would stay the same. Um, so far, these objects, with these rotations and reflections, these are very common kinds of symmetry, but not the only kinds, um, they have discrete symmetries. You can't rotate the square by just 17 degrees or 17.1 degrees or something like that and have it stay the same. You would notice the difference. And so sometimes symmetries come in these discrete families where you have to ratchet by a certain amount and you can't deform the symmetry by a little bit and still have it be a symmetry. But there's plenty of objects, familiar objects, that have continuous symmetries. The circle, for example. You can rotate that by any amount. I can pick that up and rotate by any amount and um, nothing will happen. The sphere, you can rotate that by any amount and in any direction. Now, it's got lines on it here that if you paid attention to the lines, I'd only be able to rotate it by certain amounts along, around the z-axis. But suppose I just wanted a, a picture that actually showed the sphere pretty well. I, maybe I should have a sphere picture that has no markings on it at all. If it had no markings on it at all, I could rotate it and you couldn't tell. One of the things I want to remind you about for rotation is that if I rotate, pick it up and I rotate it 360 degrees, not only does it not look like I did anything, I really didn't do anything. For example, suppose I had just like some secret marks on here, like invisible ink that only I could see on the circle. If I pick it up and I rotate it 360 degrees and I put it back, even the invisible marks will be in the same place. And so 360 degrees ro rotation is always going to be just nothing is happening. And that's a fundamental thing about rotation. And it doesn't matter what I'm rotating, a circle, a sphere, a box, a person, this law is always true. It's a fundamental thing about rotation. It's going to be an example of what mathematicians focus on, which is a formal property of the idea of rotation that doesn't depend on what you're rotating. Now what about how this applies to physics? What about the physical symmetries, for example, of space, the space that we live in? Well, here's three properties that seem to be um, symmetries in the sense that I can pick up an experiment and do this to an experiment, and then do the experiment somewhere else or in a different time or something, and get the same answer. So for example, translation, that's a fancy name for, you can pick up your experiment and move it from Albuquerque, where I'm making this video, to Santa Fe, 60 miles away, or to New York, or wherever you live watching this video, or to the Andromeda Galaxy, and it should give you the same, uh, the same behavior. The idea is that physical laws are the same everywhere. It's a huge, huge underlying assumption of our, fi of our science and it's been tested really, 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 really well. It seems to be true. Rotation. The laws of physics seem to be same in all directions. It doesn't matter if I rotate the, the table it's on. Now this is really important. You have to rotate all relevant things. If the experiment has to do with gravity, like the gravity of the Earth, then rotating it, you're going to have a huge dis distinction between horizontal and vertical. And so you have to make sure you're rotating the entire relevant system. But if you do, it does seem to be this is a rock solid principle. Now reflection seems like if I build one experiment and then I just sort of build a mirror reversed version of that experiment, something that would look like as if it's reversed in a mirror, um, then it seems like I should get the same answer. And most of the time I do. Interestingly enough, it turns out that it's not always true. What about additional physical symmetries? Time translation. If you just wait to do the experiment, or you do it over and over and over again, you don't change anything, you just do it at different times, we see that we get the same answer. That's a, a hugely fundamental, because otherwise you couldn't have any hope to predict the future if the very laws of nature themselves were changing in some, in some strange way. Now, conditions can change, but the laws are not supposed to change.
Now, what about time reversal? Play, like, look at a movie and play it in reverse. Now, this is interesting because our intuition says this shouldn't be a symmetry. Like, if I look at this water droplet, I don't have a video going, but I should, but oh well. Um, if I look at this water droplet, the water comes down, splashes into a million little tiny mini droplets. If I show you that movie in reverse, you're going to be able to tell, okay, that's not something I would ever see. But that's not because the physical laws are different. It's just that it's extremely improbable that the initial conditions of all the little droplets coming towards each other in exactly the right way would ever happen. Um, so there's some real subtle, subtle issues about time reversal. It turns out that if you look at the fundamental laws of physics, it was looking very, very much up until the 1950s like those really were fundamentally reversible. And that the irreversibility we see in our, our daily life all the time has to do with really what happens when you put together billions and trillions and even more particles together and sort of probabilities. But, in fact, there's even more tricky issues that we'll hopefully get to later. It won't be a, a, a huge thing, but I just wanted to mention that um, this is one of the most interesting symmetries in terms of is it or is it, isn't it true and in what situations. Here's one that doesn't seem that much uh, like what I've been talking about so far or analogous to like rotating a square or a circle. Instead of doing your experiment in the, um, the lab, do it on a moving train. Make sure that the train is not accelerating or decelerating at the time. Certainly, if the train is accelerating, if you've ever like, ridden on a train or on a subway or on an airplane or anything like that, you can tell when they've got the airplane engines on full. You can tell when they put the brakes on. You're going to fall over if you don't hold on to something. But if you're in a train and it's not accelerating, or if you're in the plane and they're cruising, you, can, you could sit, you know, close your eyes, and you can imagine you're just sitting in your chair at home. How is that possible? You're going 500 miles an hour on, the, on the, the plane. You're going maybe 150 miles an hour on this TGV train. But that's a fundamental property of physics, is that um, when you do an experiment on, on the moving train, as long as it's not accelerating, you do get the same answer. This is a very cool kind of symmetry, because if you think about it mathematically, it's a symmetry that mixes space and time because you've got to keep track of both your position and your time to understand velocity. And so it turns out that um, you can think of it as exactly a mathematical symmetry, but only if you combine space and time. The first person to think about that, not in the mathematical way, but to realize this, or at least the person who's credited with it, is Galileo. And it goes by the name of Galilean relativity, and it was a fundamental idea in physics. But um, people didn't realize exactly how important this idea was until there were problems with it. And then Einstein later came along with a modified version of it, and it turns out to be exactly special relativity. So special relativity really is exactly the application of a symmetry principle. Um, in term, in speaking of Einstein, it turns out that even if you even generalize the symmetry principle massively, you get general relativity. And you get the funky pictures like this of like the evolution of the universe and curved space-time, things like that. I'll say a little bit about that later. So somewhat historical, somewhat ahistorical view of physical symmetries. About 1915, when Einstein had come up with general relativity, the symmetries of space, and especially space and time combined into something called space-time, were absolutely central to physics. But physicists didn't actually necessarily see it that way. And I know, I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I'm, I'm kind of ragging on the physicists. My apologies to physicists. But um, it, it wasn't... Um, you wouldn't have seen a physics textbook in 1915 or even you know, 10 or 20 years later talking about symmetries and the fact that all these symmetry principles were pervading the subject. They really were, and they used them. They just didn't sort of elevate them as, a, as a, an overall, overarching principle. Um, and certainly in the mathematically general way that mathematicians had learned to, to encode symmetries. Mathematicians were in love with symmetry already at this time and knew that it had great things to do with algebra and with geometry um, and, uh, and, they, and they loved to, to speak of it. Then they had a, a terminology for it, which was group theory. And physicists, whenever they saw that, they ran the other way, or at least most of them did. But eventually they discovered that this really was what they were doing all along. Let's look at the mathematical... Actually, that's, let's, that's a good time to, to stop, because we're at about 15 minutes. So the part two, we'll start looking at a mathematical description.